we're asking, should the government slash benefits to reduce the national debt? We want your calls on this now. A leading economist has warned the Prime Minister that he must make welfare reforms if he wants to tackle the UK's rising deficit. It would mean reducing the support which is offered to the unemployed and some of Britain's most vulnerable. David Miles is a former Bank of England rate setter and has said that any cuts to the welfare benefits that encourage people back into work would unambiguously be unambiguously beneficial for the country, and more so than tax cuts or increasing migration. Marina, what do you think? What's your gut reaction to that statement? My gut reaction is it's so it's, it's just so out of order. This is basically like going, oh, I've just spaffed all my money off the wall and I'm just going to ask some of the poorest people in the society to now bail me out. This is ridiculous. So. If you're really, if this is really about getting people back into work, the the key isn't about taking away their benefits to push them into work. Mm. The key is to make work pay better because you've got so many people who are, I think it's forty percent of people who are on universal credit who are actually in full time work because it doesn't pay to work anymore. Look at the way we, people are taxed in work. You just saw from Rishi Sunak's tax return, he's paying an effective tax um, rate of 23%, I think it is. A nurse pays 20%. So I think we need to revisit our tax system. But also these people going into work, we will still, as the taxpayer, end up subsidizing a load of them anyway. If you think about companies like Amazon, who just pay uh, just above minimum wage, those people are likely going to still need some sort of welfare support to cover bills, which we as the taxpayer end up doing. So we as taxpayers are essentially subsidising these huge corporations like Amazon who don't even pay their taxes properly. So rather than tax cuts and migration, you think targeting big business would be a better approach? Targeting big business, but also... I think, and look at this, I think um, Nigel Lawson, the Tory Chancellor in 1988, he wanted to bring capital gains tax and income tax closer together. And that's what we should be doing. And, and that would raise alone £50 billion in four years. Lynn, there's also the issue of getting people back to work. A lot of people now that are unemployed are unemployed because of health issues. So perhaps maybe investing more in the NHS would be a better way of, of decreasing that tax, uh, the I don't, I don't know, because I think um, companies have had a lot of pressure to increase their environments when it comes to, you know, uh, assisting people into work, even if they have disabilities, if they have illnesses. I think we need to really drill down and see what these illnesses are as well, because we're seeing an increase of people applying, oh, COVID. Uh, uh, applying for with that as well. But I think we need to also look at depression. Um, as you know, I worked in welfare to work. And yes, it is a real thing to be depressed. But I don't think we should just sign people off, say they can go on benefits and just forget about them. I am a great believer in, OK, you need the support financially, but it should be measured. I don't think you should have large groups of, you know, 16 to 24 year olds on benefits indefinitely when they should be out there working. We can see uh, the last couple of years we've had vacancies over a million. Hence why when I now let out my properties, I'm having people that are hungry coming from other countries that are willing to work two and three jobs. Even people that are, you know, they've trained to be accountants, they've trained to be doctors, they're willing to come over and do jobs that many of our young people are turning their nose up at. So I agree with many things that Marina said, but at the same time, we need to look at why younger people are not feeling empowered to work. Yes, it's easy to say, you know, well, it, the money is not enough. But we had a culture growing up historically of us realising, OK, we are going to be on lower wages. We live at home. We work our way up. A lot of young people, they don't want to work their way up. They just want to be able to get high wages automatically because of a lifestyle of this culture that many young people want to live. Mm -hmm. I think also, I also will add to that is that young people now, they've got, they, they, they've got no hope now, many of them, of even buying property. So I think there is less of this motivation now. Like, because if they do go out and take these jobs, what are they going to be able to do that? Pay someone else, like pay some a huge rent, pay off someone else's mortgage? Do you like, think, do you they, think though just... Lynn might have a point here with a younger generation having a different mindset? There's also the whole influence of social media and the I have to have and I have to have now, exactly. and they're not willing to make the cup of tea because they have a university degree. You know, a lot of kids now have university degrees, and so the, the fact of the matter is you're just coming out of university along with thousands and thousands of other people with the same qualifications as you, you're going to have to make the tea and coffee and they just don't want to do that? I don't think it's necessary. Of course, there are, there are going to be people like that. But I think a lot of it is, um, if you speak to some young people, their morale is on the floor. Because but it's why? Like, because they're coming, out of, they're coming out of university with debt of like up to 100 grand, sometimes even more than that. They know they're not even going to get they're not going to get on the property ladder. And then they're offered these, 
let's be honest, crappy minimum wage jobs, I wouldn't want to take it. I know but they have to. We all had, like, like my, first, Lynn, Lynn, my, my, had... Fir my first job was literally, like, going back some now. It was so low. I had to work in, like, I worked at Arsenal, you know, flipping burgers. I worked in two shops. Mm. I did a paper round as soon as I was 12. Go and ask a 12-year-old now if they're willing to do a paper round or they're willing to, you know... Also, well, also, my, my nephew, so, my nephew so is... My nephew that not does that. To do those things. My nephew does a paper round, and my first job was in a dry cleaner. I earned 15 pounds a day. So oh, we, we've done this, but I'm just saying that the, the, the playing field has changed. But you've just... Now, what were our student loans versus theirs? What were housing prices relative to salaries versus theirs now? But what different. I'm saying is, do you not think there is a level of entitlement with a lot of young people where when I go <clears> into <throat> schools and I say, you know, would you be willing to, like you said, you know, for a length of time, maybe do some work experience, you're at home, uh, make the tea and coffee, you know, be in the rooms listening and progress up. Why well, should I have to do that? I shouldn't have to do that. I'd rather be a TikToker. I'd rather do this. I'd rather do yeah, that. But, that is the but, consensus. But, what Marina is saying is they're already dispirited by the time they even get to the workplace, so they just have no motivation to get but out of I bed would for be. minimum I, wage. I would, I would be dispirited if everything I see, I'm bombarded by constant pressure of needing to live almost this celeb lifestyle of having mm. everything now. There is no such thing right now with young people as delayed gratification. Things take time, and I don't think that's the culture anymore. I wonder whether two things can be true, Marina, that actually mm. these young people are very dispirited, they don't want to take these low paid jobs because they're very highly qualified and, mm -hmm. you know, why should they have to do that? But at the same time, we do need them as a country to do those jobs and get back into the workforce. And, and for that reason, maybe decreasing the benefits is a good idea. I don't think that's the right idea. I think the key to doing that is to raise minimum wage because uh, Martin Lewis, the money saving expert, he mm. put something out on Twitter the other day and I was like, Jesus, because five million people in this country uh, have outgoings that are basically outstripped by their, like, that they can't cover their basic yeah. out. We're not talking about luxuries, not about, you know, childcare or whatever. This is their basic bottom row of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and they cannot cover it. Mm. That tells me, now bear in mind, we've seen an explosion of wealth in or in people who are own big business. That tells me we are concentrating wealth at the top of the pyramid. The guy from the water, the water boss who went on to daytime TV, and he was but, he was actually he, he we, said himself. We've got the highest he taxes he over, in, in seventy years. We've got the highest taxes. Well, you want to increase no, taxes no, no, even I more? Don't, I want no, I don't. I want our taxation systems to be completely reformed so that people pay their fair share, which they do not at the moment. How can Rishi Sunak pay a twenty three percent effective rate and a nurse pays twenty percent? I pay more effective tax than Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who is worth about 700 million and married to the wife of a, uh, the, the daughter of a billionaire. How is that right? When we're talking about cutting benefits here, I just want to expand further than young people. It is also about the vulnerable, isn't it, Lynn? And we hear time and time again when we're talking about benefits uh, on this show, people with disabilities really struggle to get the benefits that they need. The system is already geared up. It would seem, to what people are saying, against them. So we can't be cutting the benefits even further for people that can't pay their so, gas also, and electricity you, or the electricity also, to charge their wheelchair. What do you think that's going to do, right? There's a, there's a reason it's called welfare. It's because it's for all of our welfare. If people who have literally close to nothing get even less, that, that's dangerous to everyone. That's dangerous yeah, to society. Yeah, but there are countless studies to show that being in work can even help those who are not well. Like I said, with depression, you are having now millions pumped into businesses where they are adapting their uh, uh, businesses, their offices to be able to facilitate people who may have mobility issues, you know? I've spoken to so many people with mobility issues I said, you know what, it's fantastic the way that companies are now assisting us to get back into work because I don't want to be at home. If you're at home doing nothing, Lynn, what it about will the people make things worse agreed, with your life. Agreed, but Lynn, what about the people? And I've, I've heard from someone, a lady, I remember her saying she wanted to work, but she was disabled. And where she was, I don't know, it wasn't a big city. Yeah. The business that she wanted to work in her area, they didn't have the money to put in ramps and this and that. So she couldn't work. She wanted to, but she couldn't. The idea that you think, like she said, she hates the idea that people think she chose this life. She chose to be at home and she sees all her friends excelling in their careers and she's stuck at home Well, then that's, this a, that's, that's and her And, and that's we're an gonna take, and they're going to take her money away. It's not not available. Like, the government have said there are so many different initiatives that businesses can go to them and ask for the funding to be able to adapt because it helps us in the long run with getting people off of benefits. OK, let's go to the phone lines. Owen from Northampton, what's your thoughts on this? Should we be cutting and slashing our welfare benefits in order to try and bring down this debt that we have? Yes, I think you should slash benefits. 
I'm an old age pensioner. I'm four pound over getting any form of housing benefit for anything. I served my country all my life. Mm. I'm now an old man, death, severe PTSD. I live in a bungalow mm -hmm. for old people that are terminally ill. Okay. Across the road, literally, there's an estate. A good 20% of 20 to 40-year-olds have never worked in their lives, mm. live rent-free, mm. get £250 a week to spend on drink and drugs. Okay, well, you're, you're, you're painting a picture. electricity and power. I think they should slash the benefits to make lazy people work. Oh, and and there's it, a lot of them in the country. I, I hear what you're saying there, and I think you're going down sort of Lynn May's argument here that there's a huge swathe of the population that could go out and work and, and choose not to. Um, but, Owen, you're already saying that you're £4 because of your pension, you're £4 over getting any help, uh, which would only mean that people like yourself would find it hard, it would be harder and harder to get any help. Surely you wouldn't. That would be kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face. No. Because the way it is at the moment, I want to see people in this country made to work to pay into the tax system and to get them off freebies. I don't mind that I'm just a bit over. All right, I struggle. I don't have money to spend. But I've got my little dog and I see all these people walking around the estates in designer clothes, okay. not doing a single day's work. They might I be think on. it's repulsive. I they, think they could they be podcasters. Benefits <laughs> and uh, conservatives <laughs> have got that much money invested themselves in big companies like Amazon. They'll never tax them because they're filling their own pockets. Well, I suppose the argument for not taxing big business is the whole trickle-down idea, which I know Marina will, will poo-poo, but the fact that if you start taxing big business, big money, they'll just put their business elsewhere and you won't get nothing. A, a percentage of nothing is nothing. Um, but, Owen, I hear what you're saying. I mean, the other thing that could potentially help us out is if we took off the triple lock from the pension. How would you feel if they decided to do that to reduce the, the deficit? No. Foreign warships that are made abroad don't have a problem. We've got two aircraft carriers, cost us billions. Now, I hate the way your forces are cut because I'm an ex-Marine. Now, I see ships like that, big companies like BAE, they don't give a warranty. They've drained billions. We've got two aircraft carriers, both broken down. They're of no use to man the beast. We've got no aircraft on okay, them. I hear what you're saying. So you think rather than taxing the triple lock, I like how you swiftly avoided answering that question, Owen, and went on to it spending on defence. But you politics, think we should, reduce, <laughs> <laughs> we should just re reduce the number, uh, the amount we spend on defence, although arguably maybe not the time for that either. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, Owen, thank you very much for your, for your call there. Sharon from West Sussex, do you agree with Owen? There's too many people that are sitting idle on benefits. Well, I think there are obviously young people that probably could get work, but we're on benefits. My husband's disabled mm -hmm. and through no fault of his own, he, he can't work and I'm a pensioner. But what I'm thinking is maybe all the MPs and all these high-powered bosses should cut their wages and put that money back in. Well, that's, that's not likely to happen, but you're shaking your head there, Lynn. No, I, I, I actually don't think that um, MPs should... I know many people will uh, scream at the television and disagree with me. I actually think MPs should have their wages increased, but their expenses slashed because we're seeing too much corruption. We're seeing too many um, high-powered individuals going under the table, through the back door. And if you think about it, if you're having people that are, you know, hugely public, where their family are, you know visible, uh, they're in dangerous circumstances being MPs. You know, 84,000 uh, or thereabouts is, is not enough in my personal opinion. But I do agree with you. It's frustrating to see people in power that doesn't seem to care enough for the average person mm. when it comes to money. But the only thing I would just add to that is hugely many people 
are concerned about migration. And it just frustrates me. I don't want to say British people culturally now are lazy, but it frustrates me that we have so many migrants willing to come in who don't actually have much money, who are willing to really work hard and so within five to ten years have their own businesses, buy their own houses, because they have that tenacity, that drive to work hard, which we have lost as British so people. So do you think David Miles is wrong then when he says that... Uh, you know, he, what he says is slash the welfare benefits uh, and that will benefit the country more than migration. You disagree with him on that? You think we need the migration to... I'm only, we need it right now because, as I said previously, the last couple of years, we've had record vacancies. Now, if we have those vacancies in the NHS, I understand the wages are not great, but in NHS, in hospitality, in agriculture, you're going to need somebody to come in and do it. In the short term, you think? In the short term, yeah. But Car we, Caroline we... Noakes, by the way, the Tory MP, she said you're more likely to be, ser be actually um, helped by a migrant like working in the NHS than you are to be waiting behind one in a queue. So I thought that was a yeah. very interesting point for Tory. Uh, Sharon, thank you very much for your call. Amanda from London, what's your thoughts on this? Is it the right thing to cut welfare benefits? Are we too generous as a country? No, no, we shouldn't slash benefits. I think to slash benefits, you're kind of you're punishing the people that need the most help. You know, I'm on benefits currently, and I was working for a company for seven years. I, I found it quite difficult, was picked on really badly. I got a master's degree and I still couldn't progress in the company, so I left. And I'm on benefits Amanda, now. What, and it's, what do you feel you were picked on for? Um, I think I think maybe being a young woman in the workplace, I felt like a lot of the older women didn't want to see me do better or climb up the ladder. Oh. So I found it really, really difficult. And actually, I got signed up for work for mental health. And I'm just saying that we shouldn't slash benefits because... We don't know what position people are in. People are working years and years and years, still not being able to afford a house. You know, I, I'm not able to afford a house. I, I've, I've not done anything wrong. I've worked. I've qualified. I've got my master's degree. I've done everything by the book, and I'm still no better off today. So I think yeah. we do need to look at the economy, and we do need to look at the society we live um, in. Um, if people on master's degree are starting to understand people who want to live on benefits. Amanda. Because actually, I'm thinking, am I that better off? And I, I can't say that I am, to be um, honest. Amanda, is, you're, you're a really interesting call because you are sort of the person we were discussing at the beginning of the show when we're talking about young people that are off with mental health and how do you solve that problem. Can I just ask, what's your feeling when you hear our first caller today saying that, you know, the, the people living across from him are lazy? Do you think there are people that are lazy out there or do you think there are people that feel the same as you, stressed out because they are very um, qualified and unable to achieve what they would like to in the workplace? Absolutely. I think I think calling people lazy, I think, is a lazy argument. I think well, you need to look at people and really get close to them to understand what they're going through. Because I have all the time people look at me and say, oh, you're fine, everything's fine. But they don't know the trauma that I've just dealt with, having been blocked at work because I was qualified and because I, well, all the things that I was doing right worked against me. So I think you have to get close to each individual person mm -hmm. and take each case by case. You can't block people together and say, oh, well, you're all lazy. You're, I'm not better off now and I've done everything by the book. I've been to college. Yeah, I, to I, I, I heard Amanda, Lind 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 just wants to come in here. Gonna, I was just going to ask Amanda, I understand that and I can't speak on your trauma and, you know, I don't know how long you are going to stay out of work for. But let's take, for example, again, I'm taking into consideration I don't know your situation, but let's say all of us who feel quite stressed or didn't have a good time at work, what if we took your approach with, you know, we're stressed, um, we're going to let that situation uh, hinder us from moving on and getting a job and being stronger, then there would be no, no taxes to pay into you not currently working. I, fe I feel stressed sometimes. Should I just not go to work yeah. because I had an issue with my current company? But, but no, the thing is, Lynn, there's a, everything in life operates on a scale. Not everybody is the same. It's like my stress might not be the same as yours. Mm. I'm, I have quite a high tolerance level for stress. So for me to actually burn out is actually something I'm ashamed of. It's not something I'm proud of. So, well, and people who know me, just, yes, you know, it's not, they know me as someone that's always worked hard and pushed forward in life. And I literally used to look at people like, oh, come on, get a job, get a life. And I'm in that position now myself, and mm. I see it so differently. I actually have so much more empathy now because of the position I'm in. So, yes, I understand everybody feels stressed, but there's levels. And I knew that if I didn't remove myself from that workplace, I literally was going to collapse. 
So there's okay, different Amanda, levels of Amanda, do you know things, what? I'm really you know? sorry you've had to experience this, Amanda, but the whole point is our welfare system should be a safety net for people like Amanda when that does happen to you. I agree, but, but not I, indefinitely. But, we don't, but, but not indefinitely, I don't I, agree. I'm about to say the same thing. I think the, the danger we've got here is that we're talking about welfare and we're talking about disability and we're talking about unemployment in the same bracket. Like, yeah. they're not the same. So, for example, someone like Amanda, who you just have to look, there needs to be a bit more care mm. before we go, you can and you can't. Well, you it's, you it's, it's difficult, it's difficult you... isn't it, that you're saying there should be a time limit on it and we should take care in bringing yeah, people yeah. back into, into work. But for somebody like Amanda, I mean, I don't know whether you're getting any help from the NHS for, for your mental health, but the waiting lists are just incredible. This is and the, this and is so it goes full circle. It's all interlinked. It's all interlinked. And again, a lot of people are out of work because they are off sick. Mm. Why are they off sick? Well, they are, I guess that's nothing to do with our record waiting list. It's all, it's all linked. We have to fund this, these things properly for uh, society to function properly. Amanda, thank you very much for your call. Julia from East Sussex, what's your thoughts? Hello, hello. Uh, yes, well, I think youngsters, they need, they need an incentive to work. And by an incentive, I mean capping rent to £500 per house. That would yeah. enable everyone to work, to actually find work elsewhere and travel. And that would give them a great then incentive. Five, 500 But what, what if the person who owns the house, what if their mortgage is 1000 Well, they'd have to move, obviously. They'd have to move. There'd be a great sort of exodus of people that obviously couldn't afford to, to, to keep the rents going. They'd have to move to a smaller property. Oh, Julie, I think I think the whole thing of capping rents at just a standard five hundred pounds would be incredibly difficult for for many different reasons. But a rent cap, I hear what you're saying. Try and create a, an economy where young people can have aspirations; they don't have to stress out about having somewhere to live, and they have the flexibility to move. I completely understand yeah. that principle, Julia. But do you do you think that the reason that young people aren't employed is because they they can't move to another city? I do. I think it's lack of incentive. I mean, the thing is, rent down in Sussex and Brighton are three thousand to two thousand, two to three thousand pounds a month. It's outrageous. Yeah, uh, rents are absolutely extraordinary, and we're going to get on to well, ninety nine percent mortgages. But rents have a lot to do with the reasons why people might need a ninety nine percent mortgage later on in the show. Uh, int interesting concept there, and lots of different elements brought up, but I think that shows there's lots of cogs to this this uh, situation. Julia, thank you very much for your call. Thanks for all your calls. We are going to have to move on. After the break, our public...